Welcome to the Behavioral Sciences section of our Practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 16 to 20. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt the questions on your own. Here's question 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Now let's go through the questions together. And question 16 is asking us which of the following is true regarding stereotypes. So what is a stereotype? That's some kind of commonly held belief about a particular group of people. So what is true regarding these? Option A is saying that they must be negative. No, that's incorrect. There are some stereotypes which say that a group is really good at something. And then there's some that say a group is really bad at a certain task. And then it also depends on whether the task is perceived to be a good or bad task. So. What I'm trying to say is that stereotypes, they can be negative, they can be positive, or they can just be neutral. Like there's a commonly held stereotype that a group tends to do some type of action. The action is really neither positive or negative. It's just a neutral action. They just happen to do that. Maybe it's a, it's a part of their culture or something like that. So option A is incorrect. Option B is also incorrect for that reason. So stereotypes don't have to be either like negative or positive. Option C is saying stereotype threat relates to changes in stereotypes over time. That's incorrect. So stereotype threat is not about changes in stereotypes over time. What stereotype threat is, is if a group is trying to perform a task, for example, women are trying to write a math test, if they know about a stereotype threat which is negative against them. So for example, if they're told that women are not a, as great at math tests as men are, and they're told this right before they're about to write the test, if this is act actively in their mind, that stereotype threat is going to impede their performance. So because they already have kind of accepted this, and they're also kind of trying to measure up and compare themselves with men instead of just trying to do their best and write the math test, that stereotype threat is going to get into their mind and impede their performance. So that is what stereotype threat is. It's not what is given in option C, which is talking about changes in stereotypes over time. And finally, D is the correct answer. So it says that it relies on the belief that all members of a particular group share a certain trait. Yes, this is pretty much the definition of a stereotype. So it is something which is true regarding stereotypes. In question 17, it says a student is trying to commit a long-term memory, is trying to commit to long-term memory, a list of scuba diving terms in order to recall them in their scuba diving lessons. They're studying in, at a dermatology library. Which of the following would be assumed to have the greatest effect on helping them to commit the terms to long-term memory? So they want to commit to long-term memory a list of some diving terms. So key thing is it's a list of things that this person needs to memorize. And they're doing so at a dermatology library. So with this question, it's almost kind of two answers which are acceptable. So answer A is saying the context effect, that one is not acceptable. Because the context effect is if you try to recall things again later on, but you're in a similar context. So for example, if this person is studying in a dermatology library, and then they then try to recall this list later on in the dermatology library, they'll probably be able to do so better because they're in a similar context, but this person has to recall them in their scuba diving lessons, meaning they're going to be in the water when they're trying to recall this. And so that context is not even close to the same as when they were memorizing. So the context, context effect is not really relevant here. And then between the primacy and recency effect, the one which would be better to help them commit terms to long term memory from a list would be the primacy effect. So that answer might be correct. It's acceptable because primacy and recency effects, they say that you're likely to remember things from the beginning and end of a list, respectively. And if you're trying to have things be stored in your long term memory, it makes more sense that the primacy effect is more relevant because the primacy effect is studying what's at or recalling what's at the beginning of a list. And then if it's at the beginning and you have that stored in your memory, it's going to be there for a longer period of time. And then it's going to just sit around in your brain for a longer period of time and be more likely to be 
a part of your long-term memory. Whereas recency effect is kind of related a bit more to short-term memory because you're kind of just remembering what the most recent thing on the list was. So it's it doesn't have as much time to be integrated into long-term memory. And then finally, option D is the spacing effect, which says that if you want to learn things, it's better that rather you rather than cramming it all into one session, so if you have a long list of things to memorize, rather than cramming it into one session, you should space out your study sessions. So have one study session, memorize a few terms, and then have another study session later on, and then space it out, and then keep going over terms again and again until you get to a point where pretty much everything is committed to your memory. And that's better than trying to cram them all like a day or two before your scuba diving test. So in terms of that, I'd say the spacing effect is the best option for having the greatest effect on helping someone commit something to long-term memory. However, this answer, the primacy effect, I would accept that as well. That's also an acceptable answer because it is also something which is important, when, especially when we're talking about lists, to help commit something to long-term memory. But I'd say the best answer for this question is the spacing effect. In question 18, it says James sees a movie one night and enjoys it. After watching, he immediately thinks that out of his friend group, his close friend Alan would feel the same way. Without knowing if Alan has even seen the movie, which of the following best describes this scenario? So James sees a movie, he enjoys it, and then he decides that his close friend Alan would also enjoy the movie. So what type of like what type of psychological term is this describing or sociological term? Is it stereotyping? No, because stereotyping is a belief that a certain group behaves a certain way. And so he's not saying that, oh, James is not thinking that Alan belongs to a certain group, which would be likely to enjoy this type of movie or something like that. He's not stereotyping his friend Alan because of the group that Alan belongs in. It's more so because of the fact that Alan is his close friend and because they're close friends, they obviously have some shared interests. So it's because of that more so than Alan belonging to a group. So A is incorrect. B is saying the observer bias. That's not really relevant here. Observer bias is when you observe other people committing some act and then you think it's due to their internal properties rather than the situation. And so you judge them more harshly, but that's not even relevant here. Option C is saying group polarization, and that is incorrect because group polarization, that's when you have a group of people and then they tend towards having one belief held in common. And even if they slightly were for that belief beforehand, just being in a group and seeing other people kind of also reaffirm that this belief is correct when you have this kind of echo chamber that polarizes the group to have an even stronger belief in whatever they already believed in from before but this is not relevant because it's not like everyone in james's friend group is is like into the same type of movies and it's not like james is even claiming that oh i like this movie because of that my entire friend group have sim has similar tastes and then they're all going to like this type of movie. He's saying that out of his friend group, one person, Alan, is going to like this movie. So James is now implying that their friend group has different tastes in movies and then Alan is the one that most likely has the similar taste to James because they're close friends and only Alan would like this movie and then He's not even sure if the other ones would. So it doesn't seem like the group holds some commonly held belief or has the same exact trait taste in movies. So group polarization is not applicable here. And finally, option D is correct. So perceived similarity. In psychology, when we're talking about similarity, we're talking about we're talking about how people have shared beliefs and interests. So if James and Alan have a similarity that means that they're into the same hobbies and they also share some same beliefs could be political or any other type of belief so that's what similarity is and then perceived similarity is kind of extrapolating from that and saying that i already know that we're very similar in a lot of different areas 
So I perceive that we're also going to be similar in this area. So James doesn't know if Alan has even seen the movie, but just based on how similar he feels with Alan, he feels that because I like this movie and we're very similar, Alan is also going to like this movie. So perceived similarity is the best answer for this question. In question 19, it says a student has answered 24 out of 35 questions correct on an exam. What is the percentile rank of his score on the exam? So someone scored 24 out of 35, and we're asked for their percentile rank. So you can't immediately just say, let me look at the percentage that they got correct. So this is uh, about 68.5%. 24 out of 35, so 68.5% or 69%, that's what the actual percentage of correct answers is. So that's the actual mark that a student got on this test. But we're asked for the percentile rank of this person's score on the exam. And percentile rank can only be determined by comparing a student's score to other students in the same class who have written that score. So other students just who have written the same test, they don't have to be in the same class. So we can't say that it's any one of these, any one of the first three options, but it's going to be option D. The answer can't be determined from the given information because we have to compare the 68.5% that this student got to other students. So if most students scored higher, then this student is going to be in the lower percentiles. And then if this happened to be a very difficult exam and only only a few students scored above like 65%. Let's say that 68.5% this student score is in the top five scores in the class. So if your score is in the top five, that means that you are in the 95th percentile. 95th percentile, meaning that you scored greater than 95% of people who wrote this test because you are in the top five. So if 100 students wrote this, you're in the top five or anything like that, then you're in the 95th percentile. And so percentile is an important thing to keep in mind because the MCAT is also in terms of percentiles. So it's a standardized test. So it's standardized against other people writing the same test or it's not exactly clear how the MCAT is standardized, but it's standardized to how other people would perform given the same questions that you were given. And so if you get a 90th percentile, that means that you are in the top 10% of scorers. So that's important to keep in mind. In question 20, it says symbolic culture is what? So symbolic culture is the symbolisms that people hold in a culture. So common symbolism. So this could be things like the written word and the spoken word as well but it also includes like gestures as well so for example a thumbs up in some symbols is indicating good job or pointing at people in some symbols is in some cultures is fine as a symbol but in other cultures it might be perceived as rude whereas in some cultures just pointing the thumbs up might be considered rude so symbolic culture option a is saying it's a subset of non-material culture and that is correct so Culture can be material or non-material. Material means like physical objects, whereas non-material means everything else. And symbolic culture falls underneath the non-material culture. So symbolisms like gestures, they don't have to be material objects. They're not material objects. So therefore, symbolic culture does fall under a type of non-material culture. And then other non-material cultures could be like beliefs that a culture holds. So once again, beliefs are not something material. B is incorrect because it's saying it's a subset of material culture, but it's not. C is saying symbolic culture reflects physical objects in the world, which may serve as symbolic to groups of individuals. No. So because it's saying it reflects physical objects in the world, that's incorrect because that would be the same thing as B, talking about material culture. Like the actual, the physical objects would fall under material culture, but then it's possible that they may serve a symbolic role or they might relate to some belief that a culture has, but that belief itself or that symbol itself, that's what symbolic culture is, where the actual physical object itself is material culture. And then finally, option D is saying 
Symbolic culture is typically not a component of cultural norms of or values. That's incorrect. So the not part is incorrect. It usually is a typical component of culture norms and values because once again, if it's considered in a culture that gesturing and pointing at someone is rude, then that's a part of your norms and values because you consider that to be rude. And if someone is pointing, then they're kind of violating a norm. And so they're going to be called rude and then it's going to lead to some consequences because of that. So symbolic culture, it usually is a pretty important part of cultural norms and values. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course on teachable.com. The link is in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot more questions and go through all the different answers and explain why it's correct or incorrect. So make sure to check out our course. Also subscribe to our channel over here if you haven't to make sure you don't miss any new videos. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.